Hi, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, Costa Rica and Ireland. And if you've joined from anywhere else, um, good morning, afternoon or evening. Um, I'm very excited to talk to you today about this bio encounter with Ireland that we've set up. So this is an interesting opportunity between the Biomaterials Hub in Costa Rica and Biobic in Ireland, where we're hoping to incite collaborative opportunities through various tracks around the bioeconomy and biomaterials. Um, just some quick housekeeping before we get going. Uh, after the initial introduction sessions about Biorbic and bio Biomaterials Hub, we're going to move into three simultaneous uh, breakout rooms, which you'll have the ability to join once the breakout rooms are open. Um, when you're there, I would request that you keep your, your mics off and the speakers will start presenting and sharing. There'll be an opportunity for Q&A. So there'll be a 10 minute presentation per speaker followed by a five minute Q&A um, for four speakers. And then we would reopen the main room so everyone can join back in. We'll have an open discussion and then finally we'll close off our session. Uh, we'll have moderators from Sinde, so from the Biomaterials Hub in each of the breakout rooms. And they will be recording the session, they will be moderating the Q&A, and they will be doing the timekeeping. Um, so with that said, I'd like to thank you all for joining. Uh, I hope we're going to have a very interesting and exciting morning slash afternoon of discussions around these topics of bioplastics, biopackaging, bioprocessing, and algae and microalgae. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce myself and then introduce Biomaterials Hub to you all, and then we'll pass it on to uh, Professor Connor from the Director of Biopic. So biomaterials in general is, is a very loosely defined term. The original definition was always around materials that are functional or functionalized for use within the body, whether they're ceramic implants, contact lenses, uh, replacement heart valves, um, but now, as you know, the, the idea of bioeconomy is becoming a big role in global industries, we're modernizing our definition, and that's what we're going with. We're going with material source from nature that can be applied to all industries. So it includes the original definition plus this additional definition of material source from nature. And this could be packaging, it could be things for the automotive industry, for fashion, and that's what we're calling biomaterials within our, our scope. So the Biomaterials Hub is a project developed by IDB and executed by Sinde. IDB is the Inter-America's Development Bank. They are, uh, they are the major funders and sponsors of this project. Sinde is also contributing uh, financials to this project. And we are executing this under the scope of Sinde. Sinde is the Costa Rica Investment Promotion Agency. And for everyone outside Costa Rica. Sinde is the company responsible for bringing in a lot of foreign direct investments through you know, all these large industries that set up operations in Costa Rica. And I think this is also very similar to Ireland uh, back in the 90s. There was a lot of foreign direct investment into Ireland, into innovation, into research. And this is what we're hoping to, to replicate in Costa Rica. So our goal is to turn Costa Rica into a, a, a big hub for research development and innovation around the scope of biomaterials. And we're hoping to be that central nervous system between the different stakeholders, you know, research institutes, entrepreneurs, having investors, industry, NGOs, rural areas as well and different communities. Um, and the way we're gonna do this and the way that we've done this uh, in the last year and a bit was building up these collaborations and connections with all of these different stakeholders, identify the needs identify the opportunity areas within the country and the region and build up awareness, build up collaborative links, uh, provide support and services and empower the different communities to, to look at biomaterials with the, with the new lens. And of course, incubate, accelerate new companies and a very important one considering Costa Rica's, um, let's say value proposition, which is supporting biodiversity. Costa Rica has about 6% of the global biodiversity and such a small landmass, which means accessibility and logistics and R&D have a huge potential within this sector. 
So our key areas are biomedical materials. So as a, you know, the original definition, basically materials um, used within the medical industry that are functional or functionalized for implants, surgical tools, artificial organs, tissue engineering. Also biosustainability, which is uh, the whole aspect of circular bioeconomy and sustainable use of materials, um, ideally towards bio-based materials, and how we can use biomass, and especially because of Costa Rica's huge agricultural ecosystem, the ability to take that, that residual biomass for the use of different industries and applications. And of course, as mentioned, biodiversity. Um, Costa Rica has a huge ecosystem, and right now it's being heavily preserved, but we need to learn, understand, and, and value this um, as a major commodity for the country and the region. So there's a lot of work and research going on into exploring the biodiversity in Costa Rica. And now we're trying to look at how we could understand the materialistic value, the functional value and the application value from a medical and non-medical perspective. Um, so we have four key action items and areas within the biomaterials hub. We're trying to build up product development and innovation capacity um, through training programs, mentoring services, inciting new startup development. We're also trying to foster new startups um, and support them throughout their stages of development from pre-seed and ideation all the way to scale and growth. And we're trying to identify new opportunities to support them through local and international partnership either from a commercialization perspective or an R&D perspective or industry linkages, which brings us to point number three, which is we're trying to build up the academic provisions to the industry needs to drive more tech transfer. So we want, we're working with the technology transfer offices, we're working with industry, trying to map out the technological capacities in the country and how we can build up the innovative ecosystem that Costa Rica has a potential to be. And lastly, increased translational R&D, um, both with, within the local ecosystem and the local research community, but also with events like this um, to create new collaborative opportunities with global R&D facilities and global industries as well. So a few of our activities that we've had over the last year and to come over the, uh, this year, so we've had training programs for the students and budding entrepreneurs who have ideas, but don't know how to you know, utilize it. We've also had innovation challenges around biomass valorization, waste valorization. We've created another encounter event in person where we've engaged with people from the industry, researchers, and we've tried to create new opportunity areas and identify linkages between the research of the academic system and the existing industry that's present in areas in Costa Rica. We've also accelerated startups through partnerships, through our green tech program. And we're also working with a few international partners to create a venture building program. So this year, we're also developing another innovation challenge focused around bio-based packaging. Um, this is in collaboration between SMEs that would solve the challenge for industries. We're also setting up an R&D based bioventures call or grant focusing on, on bio-based materials and innovative biomedical materials. We've got a flagship event from Sydney in, in June uh, 2023, and we're gonna be organizing the day two of this event, which is focused on biomaterials. And of course we've done some other, let's say not so interesting uh, from an R&D perspective, but important for the entire regulatory framework and the ecosystem in general is developing a suitable IP policy um, that supports innovation, supports R&D collaboration. And we're also supporting some of the outcomes of the initial bioinnovation training program through a second stage incubation phase. So we've done a lot this year and we have a lot more to do um, for the coming years. This is a pilot project, so we're hoping to see how this builds up and acts as that central nervous system within the biomaterials ecosystem in Costa Rica and the region. Um, now, I would like to pass this on to, uh, 
to Professor Kevin O'Brien, Kevin O'Connor. And yeah. yeah, take it away. He's the director of Biobit. So we're looking forward to, to your introduction. Thanks very much. Um, thanks for the introduction as well and the uh, um, intro into your own hub, which is great. Very interesting. I think there are many positive overlaps or possible overlaps. So um, I'm going to try and share my screen now. Um, have a look. Uh, this might take just a second. Can you see that? Yes. Great. So um, thanks very much for the opportunity to tell you a little bit about uh, Biorbic. So uh, in the short presentation I have, I just want to give an introduction to Biorbic uh, and then talk about specific examples uh, like Farm Zero C, but also then maybe just uh, project examples of uh, bioprocessing and biotechnology and biomaterials just to uh, give you a flavor so that uh, you can see the uh, potential collaboration points and then just some conclusion. Um, so Biorbic was set up in 2017. Um, we had been applying for maybe the best part of two years or preparing the application and getting it ready for, um, for the funding agency, Science Foundation Ireland. Um, but our vision is to be a leader in the bio, bioeconomy research and helping Ireland uh, in a just transition towards a sustainable society. So there's a lot in there. Um, the just transition is not just for, um, all, um, let's say, it's for all of society. It's not for just uh, some people. So we would look at uh, farmers, for example. We also look at industry. We look at um, um, citizens, uh, people who are maybe not directly uh, working in the bioeconomy, but are impacted by the bi uh, bioeconomy. And um, so it's really true uh, excellence and research that we want to achieve that and working with industry and working with farmers and a variety of uh, um, stakeholders. So we see that global challenges can be brought down actually to local challenges. You often see that the global challenges that we face uh, can be addressed locally. Uh, and we want to be able to work again with stakeholders um, and then help to translate the research. Yeah, so we want to do fundamental research, but we want to do research that's also oriented towards specific uh, challenges uh, and apply our knowledge and apply the outcomes uh, of the research. Um, and I've, as I've mentioned already, it's really about excellence in research. Uh, we want discovery, but we also want innovation. We want invention uh, and for that to be applied. Uh, and we find that collaboration is the best way to do that. Yeah, it's really important to be collaborative. Um, it's not just um, scientists, it's also social scientists. Um, it's political scientists. Uh, it's a variety of different um, actors within uh, the research sphere uh, that are really important actors, and then looking at other actors outside of research uh, and looking at that locally, nationally, and internationally. Um, we also really value training of our PhD students and our postdocs, so we want to create future leaders. Uh, we want to be able to provide them with the skills. Some of them are hard skills, some of them are soft skills. It's about also helping them to realize that engaging with the public, using public engagement, which isn't core to their research, but it's really important uh, to inform their research. So it's about talking to school kids, it's about talking to politicians, it's about talking to farmers, uh, it's about talking to industry, and um, it is about going out there and talking about your science, but also engaging in discussion and dialogue. And we hope then that will result in engaging, as a result of the engagement, inspiring and involving uh, societal actors, public actors, um, to develop the bioeconomy and again to have that just transition. So, like I said, collaboration is really important. We collaborate with a lot of um, um, research institutions uh, within Ireland. Um, you see there Chagas, which is Agriculture and Food Development Authority, but we have lots of universities as well uh, and technical universities as well as maybe more traditional universities. They're not just based in and around Dublin, uh, but they're also in other parts of the country. Uh, and we have a lot of industry uh, collaborators as well. Uh, a lot of them are based in Ireland and a lot of them are based in uh, rural Ireland uh, in the countryside, but we also have international collaborations as well. But I don't have time, I suppose, to go through all the international collaborations uh, that we have as well. Um, so like I mentioned uh, previous, in a previous slide, you know, we see the global challenges 
as being locally relevant. So for example, greenhouse gas emission, that's globally obviously a huge task, but Ireland also uh, faces its own problems with greenhouse gas emissions. And I'll talk about that with respect to the agricultural sector. And there are key targets in Europe, there are key targets in Ireland about reducing our greenhouse gas emissions and ultimately achieving net zero uh, by 2050. And really important um, contributors to greenhouse gas and contributors maybe to greenhouse gas reduction uh, are the uh, operational systems that exist within the bioeconomy. That's agriculture, that's forestry, that's the marine. And how do we, we are building programs, we're building projects and we're operating projects at the moment uh, looking to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, looking to uh, ensure that the operational systems are climate neutral. Um, but we also recognize that society will produce waste, whether that's plastic waste, whether that's greenhouse gas emissions like CO2 is waste, whether it's food waste. And we would use the word unavoidable food waste. We don't want to promote food waste. We want to say if there are unavoidable food wastes, how can we actually use those resources uh, and maximize uh, their valorization? And another one, of course, is about nature and biodiversity. So biodiversity is actually impacted by uh, the operational systems and by the waste we produce. Um, and so uh, it is important to understand that when we're going for climate neutrality, we also have to be nature positive and the restoration of nature and the preservation of nature are really important. So in our program, then um, we have a number of platforms. So we have an overall ambition and that's to support the just transition to a climate neutral circular bioeconomy. And there's a lot in there in that, uh, that phrase, but we effectively have five platforms. Uh, and those platforms deal with different aspects of the bioeconomy. And within each platform, you have challenges. So we build teams around different challenges uh, within a particular uh, platform. So for example, in healthy ecosystems, we look at biodiversity, we might look at biodiversity in the marine environment, look at biodiversity in, um, um, sorry, I'm mean, thinking of another example, in peatlands, because we have a lot of peatlands uh, in Ireland. Um, so there are two um, challenges that we're going after. Um, and then we have the climate neutral operational systems, which I've mentioned, you have forestry, you have the marine, you have plant-based um, production and you have animal-based uh, production in agriculture. And then the waste that like I've mentioned uh, as well in the previous slide, you know, you have things like greenhouse gases like CO2, there are, it's actually a very good resource um, to convert it into other things like chemicals. You can take food waste and convert those using, for example, anaerobic digestion. It can produce methane, uh, but that's a relatively low value product as an energy source, but you can also produce things like fatty acids from anaerobic digestion. You can short circuit anaerobic digestion and those fatty acids are a much higher value. And of course, plastic as well. We have uh, projects on converting plastic into uh, products of value. Um, we also want to look at uh, the system as a whole, the bioeconomy. And uh, what's really important here is that uh, we don't want to replace a fossil linear economy with a bio-based linear economy. So we have to look at circularity, we have to look at the movement of resources, um, we look at the use of energy, um, and also apply data uh, and understand uh, data so that we can actually be smarter about uh, how we design uh, the bioeconomy and the circular bioeconomy. And finally, but not least, um, we also have a number of enabling actions. So the four platforms to the left, um, We'll all have, uh, like we're, we're building actually, we have phase one now at the moment of our funding and we're going into phase two. And um, we will have social scientists, we'll have people with life cycle analysis, we'll have people who are um, skilled in, in economics, for example, and they will work with each of the challenges and each of the platforms in order to uh, help them to better understand how one, uh, their research is uh, impacting society and two, how we can translate and bring the key messages from that research towards um, politicians, towards civil servants, towards industry, towards society, uh, and also it'll inform our um, educational program for our PhDs and our postdocs. And these challenges interlink um, at the, within a platform and across platforms as well. So just give you an example with Farm Zero C, which is a, a, proje a project funded by Science Foundation Ireland, and it's about empowering farmers to make changes so that they can become climate neutral, but also delivering lasting impact. It's not just that the project when it ends uh, would stop. We really want to enable and empower farmers to make changes and long-term changes. And we collaborate with industry on this. Carberry is a, um, a milk processor and they have um, 
a farmer cooperative. They have 1,200 farmers in their cooperative uh, and they're trying to um, achieve this climate neutrality with their demonstration farm. So we started with a real commercial farm that they're using as their demonstrator and we're working and collaborating with them to try and uh, change the farm. So Ireland has a particular problem with greenhouse gas emissions because 33% of all of our emissions come from agriculture. So it's an area that we absolutely have to address. And we're testing various things like animal emissions and manure emissions. We're looking at the carbon sequestration capacity of grasslands because we have a lot of grasslands to feed our cows. Uh, we're looking at how we can change from grasslands to other types uh, of uh, grasses, mixed species, multi-species, in order to try and make uh, the um, grasslands more resilient. Um, we're also looking at the renewable energy on the farm. Uh, we're looking at a habitat mapping so we understand the impact uh, of farming on uh, biodiversity. Um, and we're looking at the extent of the habitats and the quality of the habitats. And then we do a comprehensive quantification of all of that in so that we have life cycle analysis uh, of, the, of the data, but also building a business model then that is suitable for the types of farms that we have in Ireland. They're not large scale industrial farms, they're family owned farms, uh, typically having maybe 100 cows, 120 cows, maybe 80 cows, something like this in that kind of range. Um, then on other projects that we have as well, uh, we work with the mushroom industry, for example, that want to actually uh, produce bioactives. So uh, we're trying to use fermentation, for example, biotechnology to grow the fungi and uh, not as fruiting bodies, but actually as mycelia uh, and then extract the uh, bioactives or dry down the powder to have uh, a bioactive rich uh, mycelium. And we also have projects on producing biodegradable plastics using bacteria. And I think you'll hear more about that uh, in some of the uh, breakout groups. Uh, we're in this uh, particular example, we're showing you polyhydroxyalkanoate, which is PHA made by uh, bacteria. Uh, the bottom left there that you see is um, biodegradable plastic or PHA inside in these cells, an electron micrograph. And to the right here are just some of the um, pieces of um, PHA that, that we made in the lab. We also use synthetic biology so that we can uh, generate and create different pathways, blocking uh, different side pathways to try and increase uh, product production. Um, and we also work on a number of different projects where what we're trying to do is improve health, whether that's um, environmental health, uh, animal health, human health, by using extracts, for example, from uh, seaweeds, from algae, uh, by producing some uh, products using biotechnology. Uh, by altering the diets uh, of animals like pigs in this example, by feeding them mushrooms or particular extracts of mushrooms, uh, we can improve uh, the health of the animal and reduce the dependency on antibiotics. And we're also involved in policy development, uh, again, with our social scientists and, and a variety of different scientists in the center. Um, and we are influencing, I suppose, the direction in which uh, policy for the bioeconomy is going. We organize Bioeconomy Ireland Week, in collaboration with a, a wide number of uh, stakeholders in order to spread the message about bioeconomy, but also to hear from people. Uh, we are chairing an advisory board for the National Bioeconomy Forum, which is founded by the government. Uh, we're informing Climate Action Plan for, that was out in 2019. We're collaborating with the European Commission on their mission areas. Uh, we're writing uh, white papers, I suppose, for the Environmental Protection Agency and for the government on how we can fast track innovation in the bioeconomy. And we're also part of networks like the All Island Climate and Biodiversity Research Network, um, which is uh, promoting collaboration uh, on climate neutrality and on increasing biodiversity. And so in conclusion, I know that's a whirlwind tour, but effectively we are trying to address a wide variety of challenges. A lot of them are in and around climate and circularity, um, but they are locally relevant and as well as globally relevant. And we think and we know that partnership is absolutely critical. Uh, to achieving our goals. So we collaborate nationally, locally, nationally, and internationally. And that's it. That's the, the whirlwind tour. I apologize it was so quick. Thanks a lot. That was really insightful to really understand about Biobic. And I see a lot of synergies between the, well, at least Biobic and the potential that Costa Rica has as a country and the researchers and the research ecosystem that we have here. So without taking up any more time, I'd like to invite you all to join the breakout rooms. My, my colleague, Jonathan, will be setting that up right now. 
you'll have three breakout rooms, the bioprocessing, bioplastics, and the algae. And you'll be able to choose whichever one you want. Uh, we'll have four speakers for each one. Uh, I'd like to remind you that the speakers, there's going to be 10 minutes um, speaking sessions, 10 minute presentations, followed by five minute Q&A. Uh, the moderators will be timekeeping and you will be, well, at the two minute mark, you will be, let's say, reminded that your time is almost up and then we can move on into the Q&A. So, yes, um, very exciting time. I'm excited to hear the presentations, at least in the breakout room that I'm going to. Uh, I'll be moderating the bioprocessing breakout room. So if you please make your way to the different breakout rooms if you haven't already. Thanks very much, Adim. I'm going to focus on the six emerging technologies that we work with in today's presentation. Uh, there are many others, um, high pressure processing, cold plasma, ozone that I won't mention, uh, but they're also very promising. The first three technologies I'll mention to you are um, pulse electric fields for very high voltages are applied to foods and matrices uh, for various effects. Ultrasound is another technology where sound, uh, high intensity sound above the threshold of human hearing is used. And then you can also apply light in various forms, be it UV light, blue light, high intensity light. Collectively, these technologies are referred to as non-thermal uh, because their mode of action or their mechanism is something usually different than heat. The second group then uh, encompasses moderate electric field heating, which involves electric fields uh, lower than pulse electric fields. It involves radio frequency heating. It involves microwave heating. And essentially, these are all classed as thermal, but their heating mechanism is, is, is different to, uh, to conventional heating. Uh, what do all of these things do to foods? They do lots of new things. Um, pulse electric fields induces electroporation. Ultrasound induces cavitation or you get sonic chemistry. Light uh, induces changes at the level of DNA. It creates secondary metabolites. And then the, the three heating technologies, and they all heat volumetrically, albeit by, by very different uh, mechanisms, conduction or ionic depolarization or dipole rotation. This graph shows the, uh, the, the collective sum of the scientific publica publications in these technologies over a 50 year period from 1970 to 2020. You can see you know, uh, a significant, nearly exponential growth in the number of publications. I started my PhD in 1991. There were three papers that year. Uh, in 2020, there were 593 papers collectively on these technologies. So quite a significant growth and interest in them. Why is that? Well, because they have so many potential applications They can be used for many things. I'll just quickly call some of them out. Deforming, heat transfer, volumetric heating, inactivating microbes, modifying structures, extraction, vitamin D elevation, valorization, and many, many, many other, uh, other areas. In terms of uh, green processing, uh, the, the next point I want to make is that these technologies uh, or green food processing, it's, um, it's uh, you know, it, it, it's a, a, a relatively new term. Uh, green processing is based on the discovery and design of technical processes, which do a number of things. They usually reduce energy consumption. Uh, they reduce water consumption. Uh, a lot of the time they allow recycling of products through biorefineries. And of course, they also ensure safe and high quality products as well. And many of the emerging technologies that I've mentioned to you, and many, not all, but many of the applications I've mentioned to you, uh, do some or two or three of these things, okay? Now, I'm not going to spend long uh, today talking about food applications because we're more interested in, in bioprocessing. Uh, but, uh, you know, if I, could, if I had more time, I could go into this in more detail. But just to quickly mention a very successful application where um, a technology like pulse electric fields has been used, uh, basically, uh, you know, and it, it ticks all the, the green processing boxes that I mentioned on the previous slide. And it, as a result of that, uh, and the fact that it also produces a high quality product, it's, ex, ex, uh, you know, achieved a significant commercial success for a particular application, which is softening of potatoes. And, you know, uh, you know, it's become nearly the industry standard, but not a lot is published on it. By contrast, then, 
there's another application for the same technology, which has also achieved, but much more modest commercial success. There's significantly more published on it. Uh, but as I said, the success has been, it, been more moderate and, and certainly hasn't been taken up to the same extent. And that's the use of, of pulse electric fields for, for say, preservation of, of beverages. Other examples, again, and just glossing over the food, another emerged example is involves light technology. In Ireland, we produce significant amounts of mushrooms. They're grown inside in polythene tunnels where they're a poor source of vitamin D2. However, they have the inherent mechanisms within them to, to uh, produce vitamin D2. So if they're treated with high intensity light for very, very short periods of time, you know, you can elevate the, the, the vitamin D2 levels in, in the mushrooms. And this lends itself on, and I'll just quickly mention this as well. It's not it's not an area I, I'm particularly active in, but some of my colleagues are. Uh, it's 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 about um, you know the use of emerging processing technologies to induce, say, post harvest abiotic stresses in in in, in plant products, usually speaking, and uh, you know this can lead to all sorts of potential outcomes like improve nutritional value and enhance nutraceutical quality and so on. Uh, and this is another area where uh, these technologies uh, can be used. The final one I mentioned before I hand over is uh, there's also a significant number of publications in waste stream valorization. Uh, and this work predominantly, you know, or a lot of it involves these technologies to you know, mainly extract and recover nutraceuticals from side streams, like things like pomace, apple pomace, grape pomace, orange, orange pomace, uh, brewer spent grains, potato peels, and many, many other things. And uh, these technologies can be used to enhance and accelerate the release of, of valuable compounds from, from these matrices. I'm going to now hand over to my colleague, AJ, who will just finish off the, the, the rest of the presentation. So, Hello, everyone. Uh, I work uh, with uh, Jimling specifically on the food waste challenge within Biobic. So Jimling's expertise is uh, um, in, in uh, process technology, in novel food production and so on. Uh, my ex what I bring to the group is uh, expertise in bioprocesses and waste valorization, uh, sustainability and so on. I uh, I specifically work on anaerobic digestion. So uh, a part of it is making the entire, the process of anaerobic digestion more uh, commercially feasible uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, in improving the cost benefit uh, of the process, uh, looking at the actual biology of the process itself, uh, pushing it towards more biorefinery applications, as well as integrating anaerobic digestion into a greater uh, uh, circular bioeconomy framework, uh, using it to bluster the entire uh, structural design of the process uh, of of uh, the the uh, systemic design of circular economy. Uh, so together, what we do is we apply a lot of uh, the technologies that uh, Jim just mentioned into improving the process of anaerobic digestion. Now, anaerobic digestion is a process that can take in a lot of uh, varied organic uh, substrates and turn it into biogas, which is uh, essentially methane that can be used as energy. Uh, what we do is uh, we uh, look at pre-processing interventions using uh, some heating technologies, electrothermal, uh, electro processing technologies and so on, and improve uh, these substrates that go in, in terms of those, these improvements could be improving bioavailability, which would then increase the productivity of the process or increase, improve the, logis uh, the logistics of the anaerobic uh, digestion process, or just uh, add some value uh, to it as a fuel. Now, about 70% of uh, the waste that uh, of the substrate that goes into an anaerobic digester gets turned into uh, effluent, which we call digestate. Uh, this is generally treated as a waste, but there is a lot of value in here. It can be used to produce uh, uh, fertilizer, to produce noble biomaterials, or turn into feed that can be put back into uh, the whole uh, bioeconomy. So what we uh, do over here is we look at uh, post-processing interventions using the same technologies and see if we can make that process a bit more easier, a bit more commercially feasible. Uh, so what we uh, the the i the, the greater vision that we have uh, of of bringing together these two uh, uh, 
uh, activities of, of uh, processing technologies as well as anaerobic digestion and uh, uh, improvement of uh, uh, commercialization of uh, anaerobic digestion is uh, basically what we do uh, at the core of our research. We it, it's still uh, using uh, these two interventions to improve both the commercial anaerobic digestion as well as uh, look at turning it into a biorefinery, uh, moving it towards more uh, novel bioprocessing that can be used uh, 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 for, uh, you know, uh, for, for generating novel products, as well as uh, look into, uh, sorry, uh, integrate. Just please start wrapping up. We're yeah. running a low on time. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, integrating it into the greater circular economy uh, framework. So looking at reutilization, reduction, valorization, as well as uh, looking at the societal impact of uh, of all these activities, and then I can't click it off. Yeah. Uh, and then ending, turning it into a, a process that can generate a novel foods, novel products, as well as other novel technologies. Yeah. Okay. So just to quickly conclude, I suppose uh, novel processing technologies, I suppose they're not um, not a silver bullet compared to conventional. Um, they certainly have niche applications. Uh, in certain instances, you know, we could discuss it in more detail. They can be much greener than conventional and they can be used in food processing to maintain and enhance the quality and nutrition of products. Uh, but they're evolving significantly in terms of their applications. And, you know, there's quite a lot in bioprocessing, uh, quite a lot of scope for them in there. Uh, but I suppose to get uptake of these technologies, you have to work with research performing organizations, have to interact with industry partners uh, to get engagement and so on. But it would seem to have a definite role to play in the future of food manufacturing and in bioprocessing. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, we're open to a few questions. You, you're welcome to put your hand up or type this into the chat. I'll start with one question that we have. And that is uh, from Professor Giselle Tamayo. Good day. I was wondering on these examples we're hearing in adding value to waste and biomass. Oh, how is the business model? What is the business model? And can you provide economic examples on how these have impact on the economy? Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, so one good example would be uh, 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 a collaboration project that we've been working on for the last two years with a company called Food Surplus Management over here, which is uh, uh, one of the largest companies in Ireland that take food waste in from around the island and turn it into uh, a, a, a fuel for anaerobic bioreactors. Now, their issues were is initially the issues were logistics, uh, which is transporting off uh, the food waste from their the central facility to anaerobic digesters uh, around Ireland. Uh, over the last uh, year or so, because of issues with, uh, with energy prices and everything, uh, the cost of all these activities went up a lot, especially the cost of transportation went up a lot. Uh, the energy that was uh, uh, the, 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 the changes in what en the, the, the energy price of the, of the feed was also fluctuating a lot. So what we we worked with them, we're working with, actually we are working with them on a couple of uh, different things uh, that target that that specifically target the bottom line or uh, the business model. Uh, the first is uh, treating food waste on their facility, uh, essentially pasteurizing the food waste before it is sent to the anaerobic digesters. What this does is it removes the burden of pasteurizing the effluent that comes out of the anaerobic digesters for those companies. And that can reduce their costs by up to 30%. Uh, that is the operational costs. Uh, the potential over here is removing the capital costs as well if the pasteurization is done uh, uh, you know, off-site. Uh, the other thing is uh, looking at heating technologies for reducing the volume of the food waste. So by just uh, removing the water uh, content of it, which is not energy rich, and that would decrease their uh, logistics costs in terms of uh, transporting and so on. So I think those would be... Uh, there's a follow. There's a follow-on question from uh, Professor Tamayo about the monetization aspect. 
Um, for example, have you have you done the economic assessment of you know for every yeah. dollar invested, you know what is the ROI? Uh, so we are still uh, we we have done some simple economic models uh, for the uh, the pre pasteurization bit. Uh, what we can see is uh, for every I I wouldn't say for every one dollar invested. I I wouldn't have the figures for that. Uh, but we have done ROI calculations for uh, the capital costs. Uh, those would be, uh, the technologies would pay for themselves in terms of uh, the, the fuel savings and in terms of the improvement in uh, the biogas generation within uh, two, two to three years, which is pretty fast for this kind of, uh, 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 in this industry. Uh, I wouldn't really know if uh, I, I, we don't really have a figure for uh, the improvement of the value of food waste that is very much up to uh, the negotiations between uh, uh, the company that we work with and the company that they supply and uh, that's that, that's waiting a lot so I, I wouldn't have any figures right now for you all right um, thanks have something for beth on potatoes on potatoes i think the return on investment there is le less than less than 12 months uh compared to the conventional method because of the huge savings in energy and fl floor spacing and so on it's very 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 quick um that's probably an extreme example but um capital but yeah it's 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 it's, it's i think around a nine month return i think or something like that so that that's what i'm told anyway by the by the uh people who supply the, the equipment all right, excellent. Thank you very much, Professor Ling and Professor Ajay. Uh, we can move on to our next session. Um, so this is by Dr. Cindy Torres. So looking forward to your presentation. The floor is yours. Thank you, Adina. Good morning, welcome to my presentation. As you could read, <laughs> my name is Cindy Torres. And um, let me check. My name is Cindy Torres, and I'm going to talk to you about the advanced biomass material processing that we do at University of Costa Rica uh, from our lab. Um, well, they asked me to give you a background briefly, and I I have here some relevant personal framework. I am a chemical engineer, it's my base. Please uh, forgive me any mistake. I'm, I'm not a um, native speaker <laughs> in English. So um, I, I was telling you that my degree um, is that I have a master in material processing. In my PhD, I did it in collaboration with Western Ontario University related to biomatification, mostly in kinetics and catalysis. Well, uh, we have um, a lab that we call it IDEAT lab. And uh, this is a collaboration space. We have a interdisciplinary group with Dr. Mavis Montero and other collaborators at the chemical engineering department. And I have some research affiliations in the science and material research center in the electrochemistry and chemical energy research center. I also um, hold um, some collaboration with Biomatech, which is a company that I am a founder and president, and we work as sustainable development in the region. Um, my experience um, um, is also as a board of director is from different energy companies here in the country. Well, this is the faculty of engineering. Uh, where I work. And as you can see here in this picture, um, that picture is uh, those buildings. Behind those buildings, we have our space that we call Ideas Lab. In this lab, um, I'm going to, to, to give you some facts that what have we been working on, but uh, I'm not gonna dip in any detail, but we can discuss that later. Uh, we have been studying the biomass that we produce in the country, not only for the bioenergy, uh, but also for biomaterials. 
Um, as you know, uh, here in, West, in Costa Rica, we have a, a rainforest um, weather, if I can say, in, in mostly part of the country. And we have the highest net annual productivity of biomass. So um, we have measured about the, the biomass production in different territories here in, con in the country, but mostly energy use for con direct combustion. And right now, we are planning, um, and sorry, we are working um, in this derivative cellulose production and a bioceramic that we call nanohydroxyapatite. And this uh, bioceramic, we can use it to create new products. So there is like a merge point that uh, we are interested in is the uh, cellulose nanofibers and cellulose nanocrystals just to produce biomedical printing with the bioceramic that we produce. And the carboxymethyl cellulose, we are planning to obtain this product for cleaning products and everything. So our focus is as the last uh, presentation, how can we create this bioeconomy in a sustainable way and of course, um, to overcome the barriers, the barriers that we have here in the country, just to produce, to create new commercial applications of the technology that we are producing. Um, we also uh, formulated a toothpaste and an oral gel with the nanohydroxyapatite. And um, we are expecting to launch a um, a relationship, a commercial relationship, just uh, to do the technology deployment for the nanohydroxyapatite production that we already have. And we um, are uh, planning to develop the business to business model uh, for direct uh, product application of these bioceramics as well. In the academic area, we have been studying the cellulose nanocrystals production from biomass waste uh, using different uh, reactors. But in this case, we are proposing the electrochemical application. And this is collab, of course, um, we use all the models, phenomenal transport and everything that we, we use for different processes just to apply in this case and in looking for the technology that we already have available in the world and how to improve it, how to adapt it, and how to be feasible for our country. So we are working in this optimization and process design. We have already some residues um, um, uh, planification. How can we do this recovery? All the unit operations that we have to design for this purpose. And um, we have these pre-treatments, adaptations, and scale up in order to have in a small scale production, this kind of industry. Of course, that we are doing right now this reverse engineering just to, to meet the market restriction cost because we have to create these processes um, in a competitive way, in, in, in a competitive way if we see the price in the market, in the global market, in the global supply chain. Also, um, we have been working in these analytical techniques just for us, uh, our, our biomass. Uh, our biomass is a different product. Um, if you compare it with different um, developed that you already have in Europe. For instance, if you have um, olive production, you have to adapt all your processes to produce and to analyze the different stages of cellulose extractions for that uh, raw material. We already have some results for cellulose extraction and the different derivatives of cellulose that we are planning to obtain. In the, in, uh, we have this collaboration with uh, University of British Columbia. And right now we are um, <clears throat> working on the advanced biocomposite materials using, as I told you, the CNC 
uh, plus uh, the nano hydrosecretize that we have developed. Just to create this ink, we produced this, uh, we call it bio ink that we have to validate. So right now, um, at this composite material, um, we are planning to, to develop new, new applications for this in a biomedical sector. Um, in the other part, well, we have been done the prototype manufacturing right now in two lines. The first one is the electrochemical process that I have been mentioned. And uh, with our workshops here in Costa Rica, so it's a really interesting how uh, this process can be changing depending on the, in the real market and how can we uh, face these challenges um, with the private sector is really interesting. And we have been creating a biomass classification system that we can couple to the biomaterial uh, production. And this is collab, um, give us some, um, some challenges, uh, but we already overcome them. And we have right now this application, we create a toothpaste and um, our orange gel for use, um, for kids use. And um, we expect to finish this project this year. This is the plan that we create just to support this production. We also have uh, been done, um, we done, we have done, sorry. <laughs> we have done some research on the simulation and the academic uh, challenges about the how to create the reactors that we need. Uh, of course, that uh, this is a new line here in Costa Rica uh, because we don't have any reactor similar to this. So right now we are um, doing the deployment of this system at ICAFE, which is a national coffee institution. And our perspective is, um, is really simple. We have a short-term perspective and a long-term perspective. We have seen this opportunity, how to overcome with different technologies, the adaptation, modification, creation, um, from our engineering uh, department and with the uh, basic science, of course, with the chemists. We, we work really close with the chemists here. And um, we have this vision. And our vision, well, for next step in the short term, we expect to design the process using mechano me mechanochemical reactor and an auger reactor development just for the scale up. <clears throat> and the um, cellulose nanocrystal, uh, we expect the optimization facing the financial restrictions that we have for the process. And of course, um, to optimize the electrochemical applications depending on the synthesis that we follow for the CNC's production. And <clears throat> in the nano -hat plant development, well, uh, we are expecting to finish the commissioning and to transfer this technology for, uh, to a private company right now. And of course, for the ink, bio ink, we need to validate what we are doing in a, in a, a biological way, if I, if I can say. In the long-term perspective that we have is, um, to develop these added value products, um, considering the outcome and, and income and output matrix that we have here in the country, just to measure our GDP. And it can uh, help us to measure how this kind of um, process, value process, uh, could impact the economy based in the value chain uh, that we have um, or, or we need for the process. Um, what, why and what we use for that? We use the Leontief matrix, which is a really nice economy, economical model 
that could help us to measure this rural territory's impact. <clears throat> well, this is my presentation. Um, I don't know if I can see the, 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 the questions. Thank you. Um, yeah, if anyone has any questions, please put your hand up or just, yeah. I can talk mm -hmm. the technical thing, but I think I, I didn't understand how this could I have to. <laughs> no, thanks for the great presentation. Always lovely to hear the new insights from, from your work. I see in the chat a uh, question. Um, no questions. Uh, no questions at the moment. Could be technical thing if they want. It doesn't matter. No. Okay. All right. The no questions. Oh, we have a question from um, Professor David. Okay. Yeah, no, I suppose it's a general question as opposed to a specific technical question, but it looks like, although the approach is towards cellulose, that the technologies you're using, the approach you're taking is, is more broadly applicable um, to other biomaterials too. Yes, of course. Actually, we are um, doing some composite materials using the CNC and the CNC MC and CNC. So it's really interesting that we have done because all the shear module, all the mechanical properties that we have already using the nanoceramics and with the bio uh, cellulose is, is, is a really huge opportunity that we have here. Yeah. And I guess just in, in the follow up, you mentioned like there's NMR and other um, analytical techniques that you use. Are they all based in, in your center or are you collaborating um, further afield? Yes, I see here, um, Professor Carlos Vega, because I asked him that maybe he could uh, lean in this part because as, as a chemist, I think that uh, he's um, a, suitable, a suitable person to follow this because uh, we need more experience in doing in these macromolecules because it's really, it's really hard to, to develop these analytical techniques. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We have a couple more questions um, from Joaquin. Um, hi, Cindy. David pointed out in the same direction. What's the best way to find the best use of a particular biomass? Well, we have seen here that um, we need an integration. You know, we have, we have been done studies in the north part of the country just to have like uh, the amount that we need, the minimum amount of biomass that we need to treat it. And just to be a feasible, economical feasible process, um, and to obtain the same uh, the energy that the process needs itself, and later to use it to produce the material, advanced uh, materials that we are planning to, because if we don't do it in that way, it could be really expensive. And so we have seen that there is a new opportunity because you can obtain the energy and you can obtain also the material that you need using the same streams, the same residues. So depending on the uh, physical chemical features of the biomass, uh, you could use biogas or you could use a thermochemical process, depending on that. And we have studied different um, process and scale just to see which is the equilibrium point to obtain that. Um, I think that there is not um, a general answer because depending on the biomass, you have to choose the different routes that you have to apply for that process. Mm -hmm. Okay, and one last question from Federico is, have you also worked with bacterially produced nanocellulose? Well, um, my assistant always uh, told me that, Javier, who is here as well. Um, but I haven't, um, I haven't gone, I have, I haven't gone through that way. I think that we have to do it. Um, could be a really nice collaboration if you have experience on that, because we have all the, the knowledge around that to make it possible. So it would be a really nice point to collaborate. Yeah. 
All right, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Cindy Torres. Now we'll move on to Dr. David O'Connell. Stage is yours. So I hope this does project properly. Uh, sometimes I have an issue with my laptop. I hope you can see that okay. Yeah, yeah, all good. Super. Brilliant, okay. So uh, I'm gonna tell quite a specific story, uh, which has been developed with Kira Lynch, who is my PhD student. She's just coming to the end of her, her four years now. And it was a project we developed um, after I joined as a funded investigator uh, with Biorbic. Uh, I'm a protein engineer by training. Uh, we like to manipulate proteins for function changes. But while uh, establishing in the bioplastics area with Kevin and Tanya and others, I became interested in the sustainability question around uh, cellular waste streams. So I guess you may know already that Ireland is home to very many of the world's top uh, biopharmaceutical um, companies producing protein-based medicines for cancer, inflammatory diseases and beyond um, in the tons scale. Uh, and so Ireland is a major bioprocessing hub uh, for a long time, it's been in the top three countries with India and the US for bioprocessing capacity. Uh, and that may be changing, I think, with, um, with, with, uh, with, with the kind of a, the more countries getting a higher critical mass. But we, uh, as, a, as a nation, have really uh, focused our foreign direct investment on companies like this to really build a huge bioprocessing um, uh, economy uh, in Ireland. Uh, this is reflected in a lot of the media attention and it attracts a lot of people to our country uh, and I'm a professor or an associate professor in the School of Biomolecular and Biomedical Science here at UCD. So I teach pharmacology, I teach biochemistry at undergraduate and postgraduate level. But the first thing I did when I became a professor with the school was to devise new master's programs in biotherapeutics and master's programs in biotherapeutics and business. So we get a very strong intake of students from across the world each year, coming in to learn about protein-based medicines, how they're made, uh, and also the business around it. But for example, we also teach modules such as emerging issues in biotechnology, which would cover things like the bioeconomy, uh, but also reminds us to, to look at our own industry and ask questions about it. Uh, in this slide, I'm showing you a snapshot of what my lab likes to do uh, when we're uh, on home territory, as it were. Uh, we recently uh, invented a new type of protein. Uh, in the gray at the bottom, you can see what that normally looks like in nature. It's a human calcium binding protein. And then in the two next panels, B and C, you can see we've added in new sequence. And that makes that protein go from being inert uh, to actually being able to bind to targets. Uh, and that's terrific because we've created libraries of binder proteins that help us to develop novel therapeutics. So for example, we've devised new therapeutic molecules that can inhibit uh, steps in the amyloid beta aggregation in Alzheimer's, or we might be developing diagnostics or, or other. So we're very kind of cognizant of what's going on in this industry all the time. Uh, I, I go to a lot of protein engineering meetings and we too, because we've invented new types of proteins, we have to develop new processes as well. So we have to learn how to, first of all, get the host cell to make lots of our protein. And then we have to learn how to purify that protein from all of the host cell proteins. Here you can see um, an ion exchange purification, step one, which is done in a very negatively charged um, situation. And then in step two, we increase the charge of the protein so that we end up with, you know, greater than 90% purity of protein. Uh, and that's in a microbial system. But now because the proteins potentially have therapeutic value, we have to make them in mammalian cells for clinical trials. So back to the, the, the mammalian bioprocessing uh, system then. In the red box, it's uh, upstream processing where we make mammalian cells get better and better at making protein. And all of this is done in liquid culture and suspension. Uh, and downstream, we purify out the protein product and this generates our revenue. But what's rarely talked about is the significant amount of waste that's generated by this industry. 
Um, there's a huge amount of very expensive chemically defined synthetic media that's used to feed mammalian cells. Those mammalian cells are predominantly a cell line called Chinese hamster ovary cells. They need very special uh, nutrient makeup. So the media itself is extremely expensive. Uh, it's obviously almost all water. Uh, it's high energy intensive to make. And yet, because this is such a regulated process, the media, once the cells are clarified from it, goes directly to waste. Uh, and there's actually quite a lot of resistance to asking any questions about this because what we've found out is that most companies just want to, don't want this to be uh, opened up as a question because it's um, such a regulated expensive part. So we had some very simple thinking around this. We thought if Cho cells are growing in a slightly expensive medium, perhaps once the Cho cells are removed, we might be able to take that media and give it to an organism that's a bit more robust or less fussy and what it likes to eat uh, and could we grow E. coli cells in it? So the first question is, can E. coli grow in chemically defined spent media? What I mean by this, this is chemical media from mammalian culture, which has already been used to grow Cho cells. Uh, and in the simple graph, we can see in the yellow where LB is a rich microbiological media and actually next to it in green is the spent media from mammalian culture We've added 2% glycerol, we titrated this. Uh, you can see it here without glycerol, but what we're looking at is the growth rate of E. coli, uh, and they're very happy to grow in this media. So this was already the, the, the first finding. We can obviously optimize it by supplementing with glycerol. And then the next question, this is I think our first image, so you'll have to forgive how unsophisticated it looks, but we were delighted. These bacteria have in them a construct to make a synthetic protein which has a purple fluorescent reporter. And you can see that the E. coli growing in spent media more than happily make the recombinant protein too. So we measured this in flasks and we could see that using the spent media, we were doing well to kind of match the normal rich microbiological media. My PhD student, Kira, then developed a really cool uh, software, or sorry, a uh, script. She wrote a nice script so that we could look at what was, what was happening in the E. coli. What changes did they make when well, they're now growing in this foreign uh, waste material? Well, what we see was very, very interesting. We see a big enrichment in amino acid biosynthesis as one example. We also see a significant downregulation of genes involved in carbohydrate, sorry, of enzymes involved in carbohydrate, carbohydrate metabolism. So that we used uh, LCMSMS to look at those E. coli. We also used LCMS-MS to look at what's in the media that, that's helping the E. coli to grow. And naturally we find uh, over 880 Cho cell proteins or host cell proteins in the media. Uh, and what's very nice about this is that this drives a starvation response in the E. coli and they get really good at making protein as a result. So we published this um, um, and actually I was hoping for a lot of inquiries just about it or agitating. And actually it's only this year where we finally have been approached by a few private sector actors who really want to explore this, this question more deeply. And I'll explain why in a moment. We moved up into reactor scale experiments. And as you can see, uh, we actually get really nice uh, production of our purple protein. Um, this is a valuable protein actually biotechnologically, but I think for the purpose of the story, it's valuable because you can see it. Um, and what we found is, again, in reactor vessels, we saw no loss in the production of this protein in this waste media. So we're very happy that it's, it's helping um, the bacteria to do what they normally do. So then we asked the question, could we do this? Can we expand the range of waste medias uh, which this could apply? So you saw uh, from Kevin's introduction, I know Federica has already asked a question. This is his work. He grows a fungus called turkey tail mushrooms. You can probably see why it's turkey tail. Uh, and he grows it in suspension uh, in order to drive value products. So my PhD student Kira and Federico started collaborating within the Bioorbic Center. And we've now taken spent media from turkey tail. And we can see that the E. coli are very happy to grow on that too and to make our protein. We also see, interestingly, that the Cho cell spent media can be used as a supplement 
instead of the normal protein supplement for this fungal cell culture. This is all work we're about to publish. Uh, and it just shows you that there's a lot of flexibility uh, depending in what system you want to go. We saw in flasks that LB was the best, the microbiology rich media. But when we switch to reactors, we can see that once again, the fungal spent media is just as good at supporting the production of recombinant protein as a rich medium or the chose spent medium. So it's a very robust finding. Just to make it slightly more sharp now, we've added in new types of analyses. So Kira's PhD is jointly funded by a center in Nottingham, which is entirely chemistry, uh, enzymologists mainly. Uh, and what we've learned with them is how to use techniques such as inductively coupled proteomic mass spectrometry. And now we can look at what's happening in media before culture. So we can look at synthetic media before anything grows in it and after, or if um, Cho spent media has had Cho cells grow in it, what's depleted, if Cho cells have grown in it and then we feed it to E. coli, what do the E. coli need to, to grow? And we can look at statistically significant changes in the elemental composition. And here in UCD, we've got an excellent metabolomics facility as well. So we can look at lipid changes as well as protein changes, amino acid changes before and after culture between different systems. So we're starting to get a better kind of mathematical picture of what this waste represents as value. I'm about to finish, I think I'm on time. Um, but the real question is, where can we go with this? You know, can we really develop this? Um, as I said, there's a bit of resistance in the biopharmaceutical sector because it's such a regulated space, but it's very obvious that you know, saving water, saving energy, uh, harnessing whatever nutrients remain in these systems is a good bioeconomy, biosustainability question. Uh, and one of the places we're quite excited, I presented this at the European Society for Industrial Bio uh, Biotechnology uh, earlier on this year. Uh, and what I didn't realize was the whole flavor of that meeting was about cultured meat, where there's a huge push to move a lot of what's normally done by agriculture and animals into bioreactors using um, stem cells from biopsies from cows to grow burgers, for example. And what's clear about this is, is that you know, Singapore has already become uh, a jurisdiction where this is happening, Israel next. But across the world, uh, we're seeing more and more cultured meat alternatives. And what this is going to mean is that the amount of bioprocessing waste is going to increase massively. So this question, I think, would become a much more interesting applied question. If you have any questions about it, I'd be delighted to answer any questions now, but please also uh, feel free to email me uh, and it would be great to collaborate with our colleagues in Costa Rica. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. Uh, I want to start off with a question. Uh, would this spent media be widely different with different cell types? say you have a skeletal muscle cells growing or you have um, endothelial cells, you know, obviously the proteins generated would be very different from your CHOs. Uh, how would this affect your, let's say, revalorized media for different applications? That's a great question. Uh, I think the answer is there are systems that are quite redundant. So for example, if you're talking about making IgG, you're almost exclusively talking about chose cell culture as your, as your workhorse. Uh, not entirely exclusive, but almost exclusively. Uh, of course, when you start talking about things like cultured meat and stem, muscle stem cells uh, from biopsy, you're going to have to, to reevaluate uh, what that media looks like. Um, now, importantly, I think what we've learned as scientists is that we thought it was a nice question, if albeit a rather simple question. Uh, but what we then had to learn was, okay, uh, what are the measurements we should be making. And I think the value, one of the real values of this type of investigation is we've kind of identified what the techniques we need to employ all the way down to the elemental. I mean, I think working with chemists was a great thing first off because they said, well, okay, what do you know about it now? And I said, I'm not sure what you mean. And they said, well, what do you know is in it already? And I said, well, we know there's a lot of Chinese hamster ovary proteins in there and they were going to go, Yes, but what are the, what's the chemical makeup? So 
I think that question will always have to be answered if you're going to go from an entirely new system. But one other thing I would say to you is that um, Piscia Pastoris is a yeast um, um, system used now to make protein additives for the cultured meat industry globally. Uh, and again, that too is another huge source of, of let's say, waste media. So I think there's going to be a kind of a, a very broad range of medias that are going to have to be assessed. And from, uh, just a follow-up question, from an economic or actually a scale-up perspective of utilizing the spent media, um, would they, would it make sense to have this spent media shift around for different purposes? Does it make sense to have it on site with the bioprocessors, the bioreactors, or you know, where do you see the economic value there? That's a great question as well. It's, it's a very sharp question because uh, when we first looked at this, we managed to connect with a biopharma CMO, contract manufacturing organization. They were one of the very few in North America that had both microbial facilities and mammalian facilities. Uh, and they were very interested in, in the, we haven't yet started with them, but that's not common. So it's, it's more common that a, a bioprocessing site is the one type of manufacture. Now, it may become a more interesting question uh, as I think though, the real answer to the question is, I think this will have to be driven somewhat by regulators who are going to maybe demand like that this type of waste is not um, biosustainable or sustainable in the economy. So we might need a help from regulators. All right, excellent. One last question before we move on uh, from Stephanie. Thank you, Professor David. I'd like to know if there's a specific reason of why you chose the fungus you work with. Have you tried microscopic fungi? Uh, there's not, um, there's not a specific reason. Real reason is that Federico Cerrone, who's here, I think, yeah, he is, is uh, only about 200 meters away from us in another building. Uh, and it's his technology that's developing these, hi Federico, these suspension uh, mushroom cultures. He can explain maybe very briefly why. But we just recognized that there was an opportunity to broaden the scope of what we were investigating. Uh, and it was nice actually from a center perspective to actually collaborate within your own center as opposed to collaborating beyond. I don't know if you want to quickly comment, Federico. Yeah, you're brilliant explaining. It was, yeah, simply just to increase the productivity of the basidiomycetes, mycelia that we were growing in, in bioreactor. So these, these mushrooms, when they grow, when they are grown as a basidiomycetes in, in bioreactor, they grow as a pellets. They can become macromorphologically big, as, as known as mushroom, when only when they are in, in, a, in the wild environment. But to increase the volumetric productivity of the process, we found more feasible to adapt the, the type of bioreactor that we custom designed to, to increase the, the biomass for different range of bioactives. And then thanks to the collaboration with David O'Connell and Kira Lynch and the, the vision and the, the inspiration, the, we saw that there was an untapped potential to use waste uh, biopharmaceutical stream. So as some part of the results that David shared, we are hopefully uh, eager to publish soon, so we keep in touch. <laughs> Stay tuned, we will see that in, in the scientific community. All right, thank you very much, um, you. Federico and, and David. Uh, now I'd like to move on to our last presentation from Dr. Rosaro. Stage is yours. Okay. Um, good morning, good afternoon. First of all, I would like to tell you that my throat is not so well today, then maybe you will uh, hear me um, in a funny way. And also, I didn't plan to be in the lab today, but uh, I began a, a chromatographic column in the early morning, and my assistant didn't come, so I am here in the lab taking care of the column. So. <laughs> Anyway, what I would like to talk about is the, um, what we do at the Natural Product Research Center. Let me see where do I have the presentation, okay.
Do you see the presentation? Yes. Okay. Then as I told you, well, I, I would like to talk about Ciprona. We are around 16 people and we focus on studying natural products generated by living organisms. We try to see if the compounds that we found or the enzymes of the proteins may have a possible application. And also we, we work synthesizing natural products or making transformations of them. And also we collaborate with all the research centers to test the biological activity that they may have. Just to give you an idea, well, Ciprona works in this, may say, seven areas. Uh, of course, natural products, as I mentioned it. Also organic synthesis, plant and microbial biotechnology. We help entrepreneurs and also we try to fulfill some needs that some people from industry ask us. And we do have a small group of essays that are helpful for us during the, the performance of our work. Let me see what happened here, okay. So if we talk about what we do, let me see, because I'm in another computer, I was not ready for this one. Okay. If we see the synthesis, what we do regarding synthesis, well, we, the, the colleagues are working in mechanochemistry, in quinone synthesis, and also in, in the synthesis of antiparasitic compounds. In terms of biotechnology, well, our colleagues are working at, with the streptomyces in, the, in their genome and post-genome analysis. So they are looking especially for antibiotics. And also they look into different ecosystems to check the microbiota that are on those microsystems to see what happened. For example, they, they have been looking even in the hair of the slots, in the nets of the birds, even in the solar systems to see if there are some microbial, microbial that are, are um, sorry, growing on that uh, material. Also, they work a lot in Pseudomonas putida. And in this case, they are trying to improve the, the catalyst power that the, the Pseudomona has. Also, in terms of what happened with the other uh, microbial, for example, they work with endophytic fungi, mainly to use them in biological control. And of course, they are working on, on their taxonomy. And also in terms of uh, um, waste from the agricultural processes, what well, they are trying to produce or they produce a little from rice. And also they, we are looking to see new ways to use vanilla uh, residues from the agricultural industry that we have here in Costa Rica. In Costa Rica, there are uh, some plantations of vanilla, but it's not the proper vanilla planifolia, but they are very rich in vanilla. So we are trying to get some new, uh, comp uh, some new products from, from that vanilla. And also, uh, in my case, I work 
with some justicia species because those genera is known to produce uh, colorful compounds. So I'm into what are those compounds? Well, I already know uh, uh, there are new uh, compounds and there are blue, red, and very colorful. Also, I work in biocatalysis using enzymes from plants and also in phytoremediation. Let's see what happened with this. Okay. Also, we, we work in innovation, and in this case, as I told you, we try to uh, fulfill some needs that the industry has. Uh, for example, we have been working in encapsulation natural products. We have been uh, producing a natural binder from uh, pineapple residues. Uh, we, we have uh, done several formulations for, for different products that people ask us. All of us uh, having in mind that it's very important to have friendly processes and, on, and also products. So everything that we try to do in this innovation is based on environmental friendly processes or products. Also, uh, one area of work is or are the omics and natural products per se that are linked also to, for example, innovation. Why? Because, well, we, we are working in Pujawa maize, the, the, that maize that is uh, purple, or you can see blue. Well, we are trying to, well, we are trying to use the residues, the, um, let me see, the, um, what was the name of the olotes? I think, um, do you know the name of olotes in, in English? Um, let me see, uh, for you to know what I meant. Cod, the, the cod maize, we are using the cod maize of this special maize because it's full of anthocyanins. So we are uh, producing some new products for different industries. Also, Colleagues will also work in vanilla. In this case, it's met, uh, metabolomic of vanilla, of anti-inflammatory natural products. Algae, this colleague works in metagenomic and genomics, mainly in microbial. And also we work in another center, the National Center of Food technology with uh, cacao or cocoa in this case. All this, all this is possible because we collaborate with different schools and research centers because we have some equipment. We have a, a 600 NMR and also access to 400 NMR machines. We have an orbit trap, we have a GCMS, MS, um, triple quad, and we have, we have very good equipment, but of course we, we don't have all the expertise to, you know, to find the proper, the proper use, user, uses for every compound or, or material that we obtain for, from nature. So we collaborate with other schools at national level, of course, as you can see, and of course at, at international level. And there are some more uh, 
collaborators that we have, but in the, the screen, I didn't have a space, uh, enough space on the screen to show them. So I don't know if you have any particular questions to ask me about. And, uh, hope, uh, and I'm very happy that Dr. Tamayo, the director of Ciprona, is also here. So she cannot reply any question that I cannot because I don't know everything about the, the research centers, of course. So that's all that I wanted to tell you today. Thank you very much, Dr. Rosaro. Um, I automatically see some potential collaboration between you and or the work that Ciprona is doing and uh, Dr. Dr. David, especially with the use of, of spent media for, for growing a lot of these other bacteria and natural and bioprocessing of natural products that you're working on. Um, I don't have any particular questions, but what I'm thinking is, do you see the potential of using spent mammalian cell media for some of the processes that you're working on within your research? Okay, I can, I can see some potential work, for example, with um, Professor O'Connell, Definitely, because we have some uh, proteins that are that may be useful in the future to produce a very important compounds. Um, also, I I I can see um, a good opportunity to work with uh, Professor Yin because we have a lot of uh, biomass that. We can use some residues that we have from the agricultural industry that have a lot of potential regarding also a pharmaceutical, pharmaceutics compounds or nutraceutics compounds. So I think there are a lot of, of things to do with you with our and then we are happy to collaborate, really. But I did was to gave you an overview because uh, I didn't want to be so um, punctual in some of the things that we are doing, but of course I will be very glad to talk about specific, specific things if you need so. I think that's great to hear, by the way, uh, just a comment. It's great to hear that there's an appetite for, I'm sure James feels the same, uh, that there's an appetite for that type of collaboration. I think we're, uh, all united in this center with that exact same appetite for, for collaborating with interesting groups. I mean, it looks like we can bring complementary complementary technologies to bear too. Thank you. Excellent. Are there any other questions? Um, well, I've got a clarification for uh, Professor Tamayo. Just wanted to let you know that, yeah, I wasn't talking about stem cell research. I was talking about the use of the spent media from Professor Connell's group and how that could be applied into the bioprocessing of natural products um, within, within Soprona. Okay, um, I think we're all going to move back to the main room for a quick discussion, then we'll close off the session. Um, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for the very interesting works and the presentations. I look forward to seeing how the two countries and the several institutions could potentially collaborate. Thank you. I hope everyone had a great session today, um, at least with the bioprocessing. There was a lot of interesting talks. There's a lot of uh, relevant and potential opportunities for collaboration. Now, I just wanted to spend a short moment to maybe get some feedback, maybe have some open discussions about um, specific areas of collaboration. We have all or most researchers back in this main room. So if there are any open general questions, comments, or thoughts, this is the time to do so. Um, we'd love to hear your feedback on this first and inaugural encounter session with Ireland. Um, do you see value? Do you see potential opportunities? You know, do you have an idea of where we want to take this? Open to any questions or comments. Please raise your hand. Okay, I've got one. 
So, Anna? Hi. I can I cannot start my, my video though. Oh, okay, one sec. Yeah, I think you should be able to now. Okay. No, first of all, uh, thank you very much for the presentations. Uh, I think they were like wonderful and inspiring. I just wanted to know if you add him from the from the hot biomaterials, do you have like next steps, like how we get in, in touch with the researchers and start a conversation to future projects, uh, join projects or things like that? So from our side, we will be sharing information of all the presenters, all the speakers, uh, so you'll have the opportunity to get in touch directly. Um, and as for the next step, the idea was to, well, of course, share the presentations as well, share the recordings with everyone, so you can assess the other sessions as well. Um, we're hoping that we could, once we identify potential collaborations, we start talking about potential funding opportunities and how can we look out for specific European funds um, that allow for collaboration with Costa Rica. Now, maybe uh, well, what we've seen is Costa Rica is eligible as a third country for EU funding, which makes potential collaborations very interesting and accessible to Costa Rican researchers. Um, which is one of the reasons why we wanted to push for this, this session, because we know that the opportunity for funding access is possible. Um, now, I have a question from uh, Professor Tamayo. Uh, I don't know if you want to ask the, your question or should I read out your question? Uh, you're on mute. Answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks, Arim. Um, well, the the issue here, uh, what I was he what I'm hearing is there is a lot of resources from the academia that are willing to um, add value in their research, um, and uh, the experiences that we have heard in from Ireland and and, and in particular, uh, uh, those are very very nice examples. But the elephant in the room are two things, how you can actually uh, do a, benef a mutual beneficial contractual uh, agreement between industry and academia and how long it will take. I mean, in our experience, this is something that takes something around the, a year or, or even more. And, and this is uh, actually uh, not very good for um, researchers that are looking into, into how they can um, get some funding for for this? Uh, I, I'm happy to hear that you are thinking of European funds. Um, we have been successful sometimes, uh, but it depends on uh, in our experience how well uh, positioned is the European partner to actually uh, access this kind of funding. Um, the um, the other thing, uh, the elephant in the room is. Some uh, that that I will add to to this elephant that is all, uh, that I have placed already is that we have to um, if we can if we want to uh, raise funding for this not only not only from organizations like the European Union but also from the industry uh, we will have to demonstrate that this has some value to them and and the value to them is not social it's economic I mean there are they are the private sector, as a matter of fact, and having uh, in, in hand uh, what I was asking. I mean, if you invest this dollar and and and, and over two years in, in this research, you will get a technology or a product that will uh, give you two dollars from each dollar that you have invested. That is something very important. The number of employees that you have increased in your industry given this technology that I'm transferring, is also very important for uh, actually uh, uh, providing examples that are successful in terms of investment and in this uh, joint of academia and industry. That's, that's uh, the two elephants in the room that I would like to, uh, to address and see who can help us in answering this. 
So I believe Sean has volunteered to answer some of that. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so I suppose, yeah, just on the return on investment, we did, we had a consultancy agency. Um, so they showed that for every one euro that our industry partners invested, it generated four euro. Um, now that's in phase one, typically it's higher in phase two, uh, of research in Ireland. So, you know, um, we, we do focus on collaborative projects with industry. So we receive, as Kevin mentioned, we were a national Irish national, um, bioeconomy research center. We receive funding from the Irish government through science foundation, Ireland. So we can do part of that remit and scope of what we can do in terms of research. We can do research with companies that they don't have to be Irish, as long as we can show that there's a benefit to uh, Ireland uh, and the Irish economy, then we can, for example, work with, let's just say, medical device companies in Costa Rica that want to do research. So it's collaborative in nature. So it can't be, we do get a lot of companies coming to us and saying, oh, we'd love to see if we're carbon neutral. Now, that doesn't affect the bottom line right now, but it's a reputational uh, risk to those companies. And there is that ESG component that it's coming down the tracks and it's coming very quickly and the pressure is increasing to be more uh, environmentally sustainable and the reporting uh, is going to become more and more strict. So something I say to companies is the regulations are getting tighter and then more than likely not going to get any looser to 2030. So, you know, I, while I, you know, I, I fully accept, you know, there is that, um, urgent need, like it has to provide value to, to industry economically. Um, but we're lucky that the companies that we do work with tend to have a, you know, maybe a five, five year term that they want to be more sustainable. And they realize that if I'm more sustainable, it'll have less costs as well as better reputation. We'll be able to get better talent coming in. So, um, yeah, we can yeah, read the point I want to get across is as a research center, we can work with industry from countries that are outside of Ireland, provided we can show that there is benefit to Ireland, whether that's in terms of exports, imports, um, and we have a lot of multinationals in Ireland, so we can, we're, we're kind of used to doing that. And maybe you could touch upon, um, I think, Professor Tamayo's first question, which is, what was what's the contractual engagement like when you work with these industries? Yeah, so typically we do collaborative research projects as opposed to contract research, um, and we can provide up to 50% funding. Um, so while we're a research center, we also do have funds that we're, we can allocate to our research projects. So we can double the size of a project, industry give uh, an amount, and we can match, uh, match that funding. So it's, it's collaborative in nature. So typically, the research question would be around, let's say, for example, instead of, can you tell, like, you know, tell us if we're carbon neutral or not, it'd be more, how can we become more sustainable? How can we get to carbon neutral? So it's, uh, yeah, I hope I've described that. It's not binary. You know, the answer usually isn't a yes or no answer. Uh, it's usually more collaborative that neither party knows the answer, but also we can't do the research without industry's involvement and vice versa. They can't get to the answer without engaging with the research center. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you, Sean. Uh, got a question from Cindy. Thank you. More than a question is because you ask about if we see some points of collaboration. So I would like to summarize something that they were talking during the presentations. Um, well, I see an opportunity to strengthen um, the validation, product validation that we need with them, because I see that the biological the strengths are really, are really deep and developed. So I think that we have there a really nice opportunity for collaboration. And the other thing is um, uh, that we see um, an opportunity to, 
to use the biological and cellulose process as a complement of our pro uh, of our proposal. So maybe we could work in that line to course that we could add in the in the research. Um, sorry that I don't see here. David O'Connell, I think that was the presentation. I see that maybe uh, we could have some collaboration um, using our nanoparticles and nanohydroxyapatite particles just to see the, the biological response that they have with the, the, cell, the cells that they are producing right now. And um, I think that was from, from the first presentation that they show about the packaging because here in Costa Rica, it would be really nice to produce our packaging for food packaging using our biomass as well. We have been done some work using um, a cellulose acetate from, from our residues. But of course that for the layers and the functionality, we have a really um, work to do. And the last thing I would like to ask them, um, in a timeline, what did you expect working with Costa Rica, like in a funding? How do you see some opportunities? That is my question. Thank you. So with regards to your last point, um, the idea was to identify potential collaboration links first, and then we will explore with Biovic where that funding potential lies. Christine is here uh, and she does a lot of the assessment on uh, the EU funding and the, the, the national funding in Ireland and in, in Europe. So the idea is to identify collaboration links first and then see which funding mechanism could apply to that collaborative opportunity. Um, either if it's part of an, a larger consortium or if it's just a, a bilateral research partnership, we'll have to identify what what the funding mechanism could be for that collaboration. Um, just a comment, sorry. And so in that case, I think that for that, I would like to, to propose that you could uh, include the, the graduate student program just to develop the research that we have been mentioning the past two months. Thank you. Yeah, excellent. Um, I believe we had a hand up from Derek, but it's gone down. Uh, yes, yeah. Well, you made some of the points I was going to make. Adam. It was I was just going to add further to respond to, uh, well, first, Professor Tamayo's uh, comments um, or question just around, um, well, two things. One, so being position for EU funding. So obviously Ireland is is um, part of the European Union and we're, we're heavily involved in, in EU funding programs. And we've been very successful in Ireland and indeed uh, more specifically in Biorbic in um, attracting and securing Horizon EU funding. Um, but then look, for, for from our perspective, we're also interested in other funding outside of EU funding as well. So that's part of the reason that, uh, you know, I, maybe we haven't necessarily identified that yet, but that's part of the discussions we're having with Costa Rica to see if there, there, there may be others. So it's it's kind of working together to see where there are funding opportunities. And then with industry, with the, your comment about industry, um, yes, we have faced the exact same challenges you have, and it is, extremely it can be it can be difficult to um get industry aligned with the type of research uh that we are doing and it takes a lot of discussions as sean has outlined we have been talking to sind and and adim uh, about potentially a further session where we could share some learnings with each other on that we have in ireland uh there's a we set up a knowledge a national knowledge transfer um, uh, group or organization uh, we have established and we use in Biorbic for all our industry projects and we've developed uh, template contracts for industry because it just cuts out a lot of the the um the, the negotiation 
um, and it manages expectations because I think that's the key thing. Obviously, what we have found certainly, and we've quite a lot of industry uh, collaborative projects managing expectations for industry, but then also for researchers, um, so that there's a recognition from the start on what the objectives are for both, and then the discussion is around establishing common ground where both uh, uh, sets of objectives or common object objectives can be agreed. It is challenging, but we in Ireland have spent a long time, I think, now we're not, we're far from perfect, there's no easy solution, but um, we would hope as part of this uh, engagement and today being the first step to share uh, some of that and then also to learn learn from from your perspective as well on how we can and um, can best manage that so that that's what I wanted to say uh, uh, excellent uh, we have one last question so Anna Margarita yes I would like to ask uh, which kind of joint projects are able to apply for example in some way, uh, like a bilateral projects? So I, I believe Christine would probably be better fit to answer this question from a funding standpoint. Yeah, so, um, so it's just that Costa Rica are eligible for European funding. So I guess what we do would be, we just look at the, the work programs and see where we can find um, mutual interest. So obviously you have to address every point of the call. So it would be, you know, by Orbic addressing someone, a researcher in Biorbic addressing a certain point and then potentially a researcher in Costa Rica. So it, it really depends. There's like a vast array of, of European calls and most of them would be consortium based. So it, it probably wouldn't be a bilateral as such Irish Costa Rica. It would probably be more um, a consortium, but we do have a lot of connections within Europe. And as Derek has said, we have been involved in many European projects. So um, we would have those connections in other parts of Europe. So that shouldn't be an issue. But again, like also what Derek said, like we have the European funding, but we would be you know, happy to explore other options that we are not so much aware of that potentially researchers in Costa Rica would be more aware of. So um, it's quite open, I guess, at the moment. Thank you. All right, great. <clears throat> so with that said, thank you all for your inputs and your comments and questions. Uh, I'd like to close the session by saying, firstly, thank you all for joining us today. This is hopefully the first of many uh, where we can identify new collaborative opportunities between the two entities, countries, in, and various institutions. Um, I do see a lot of opportunities just from the surface level of the science and the research potential. And I'm hoping that the researchers and the speakers and presenters and even the audience see other identifiable opportunities. And of course, we'll be sharing information of all the speakers, so you'll be able to get in touch um, and of course, if you do identify some sort of opportunity, you're, you feel free to message um, myself, anyone at Sunday, anyone at Biobic, and then we could start talking about how we could how we could bring this to fruition. Uh, yeah, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. I don't know if Derek from Biobic had any uh, closing points. Uh, yes, sure. Yeah. So uh, just for anyone who doesn't know me, so I'm Derek, I'm the, the executive director at Biorbic. Um, and yeah, so we've come to the end of the, the session today, which is the first uh, Costa Rica, Ireland bio encounter. So um, I'd like to thank all of my colleagues, my own colleagues from, from Biorbic um, and everybody from Costa Rica for joining. It was probably a bit easier for us in Ireland um, as I think they started at 2.30 p.m. or as you had to, to, to start at 8.30. So we appreciate that and we thank you. Um, just to say for us in Biorbic, collaboration is a, is a core value of the centre and we recognise that the challenges that we are addressing in particular, I guess, around climate, biodiversity challenges and then including biotechnology and others, need as many experts and, and skill sets and perspectives um, 
working together if we're, if we're to kind of address these. And then this is, of course, also uh, relevant if we're to realize the vision that uh, Kevin set out to, earlier uh, to establish a vibrant, sustainable circular bioeconomy here in Ireland, in Costa Rica, and indeed globally. And this is why we were excited uh, in Biorbic to connect initially with SINs and the Biomaterials Hub, uh, and now to meet all of you here today. Um, I think we're both relatively small countries. Uh, we have different climates, we have different biomass, I think, um, but uh, we're both looking to achieve many of the same things. And we see today really as a first step in establishing a strong partnership where two countries can mutually benefit by working together um, to achieve our common bioeconomy goals, working, I guess, um, through research and then targeting funding, which we touched on. But I think today is just a first step and we really wanted to, um, and we talked to Adim about this really kind of uh, it's it's on Zoom, obviously, but it, it's nice to actually ha have a conversation and a discussion to kind of get things, um, get the ball rolling. Um, and we had really interesting discussions, I think, especially in various different uh, groups. And it was from our perspective and Biorbic, um, great to hear some of the excellent research that's uh, happening and see some of the facilities uh, in Costa Rica. Um, and so we... We will work, continue in Biorbic to work with SIND and the Materials Hub. Um, and we've discussed, you know, I think Adim, you're going to be sharing the, or we'll be sharing the, the recording and the presentations and encourage you as researchers as well to, I guess, engage bilaterally with the with the context that we've seen. If there's some, if there's uh, people that you've connected with or research that you think is interesting or interested in learning more, then connect directly or else via um, Adim and the Costa Rica side or ourselves in Biorbic. And then just finally to thank Adim uh, and Carola and Gloriana and I guess Jonathan for organizing um, this on the Costa Rica side and particularly looking after all the, the Zoom things and Chrissy in, on Biorbic side. Um, and that's it, Adim. So uh, I'll hand back to you. I don't know if there's a formal closer, but just to thank everybody again. Yeah, thank you all. Have a great evening, Ireland. Have a great day, Costa Rica. I've put my LinkedIn and email address in the chat. So if anyone wants to save that, get in touch with me, um, feel free to do so. And I look forward to hearing any potential next steps from the research or bilateral opportunities. And we'll keep you posted about the next, let's say webinar session that, that Biobic and Sunday will be working on. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Have a good night. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.